Hey friends, let's take a moment and thank our sponsors because they make this podcast possible. Let's talk about a new sponsor, Revelo. Having a hard time hiring engineers? Revelo lets you sidestep the competitive U.S. talent market by helping you find and hire skilled remote engineers in Latin America. They only provide full-time senior engineers with over five years of experience, and they don't force you to pay for things you don't need, like a project manager. They charge a monthly fee, and you know exactly how much you're paying the engineers. They do the sourcing, they do the vetting, and you can interview the engineers before deciding. They'll manage all the paperwork, including benefits, payroll, and local compliance. And the time zone alignment is a huge win for U.S.-based teams, and it makes synchronous collaboration easy. Questions are answered quickly and effectively. To learn more, go to revelo.com slash Hanselminutes. That's R-E-V-E-L-O dot com slash Hanselminutes. And as a special limited time bonus, you can mention Hanselminutes and you'll get 20% off the first three months. That's revelo.com slash Hanselminutes. Hi, I'm Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today I'm chatting with Dennis Magna, the Director of Developer Relations at Yugabyte. How are you, sir? So far, so good, Scott. Nice to be here. Yeah, nice hanging out. Uh, just for context, uh, for some of the folks that have been listening to the show for a long time, there was a time in the past when Yugabyte, uh, your employer, sponsored the show. This is not a sponsored episode, but I am still a fan of Yugabyte. But I wanted to chat with you because I noticed that you uh, you worked on Java, like back in the in, in 2010, you had uh, deep experience working on Java at Oracle, didn't you? Oh, yeah. Like, actually, that was a remarkable time. That's, uh, I would say, how my professional career as a software engineer started. And uh, how I did uh, get uh, on the Oracle development team, that was, let's say, my third year at the university. I was studying for the uh, computer science and uh, application development. Mm -hmm. And you know what? At that third year, during that third year, I wanted to pivot. I didn't like high tech. We had a lot of the labs that were in C, and all of those labs were relatively boring. Yes, we would study different algorithms, data structures, etc. And then you would, and a professor would ask you to go ahead and create a console application. Nothing exciting for me as a student. And that's why I wanted to say, okay, like I, I will get this diploma and then I will fin find out what I'm actually going to do in this life. But then during the third year of my education, I came across Java. One evening, I still remember the day I was sitting at uh, my apartment and I took a book written by our professor. The book was, let's say, just 20 like, or 50 pages about Java, how quickly create a simple application. And I spent around two hours. I created my first uh, desktop application with UI, with buttons, with dialogues. I was so impressed that I kind of couldn't stand. I picked up a phone and called that professor saying, hey, I completed like a half of the book. And right now I'm just struggling with this task. Something is wrong in your book. Like I'm getting this exception. Those days, it was impossible, uh, let's say, to troubleshoot an issue. It was hard to troubleshoot an issue through the internet because Stack Overflow was not the thing yet. It was not released. It was not available. But my professor helped me that day. And starting that day, I was in Java. Six months later, I've got the first uh, project. I was paid for this project. I developed uh, some service for a local retailer. And also, like eight months or so later, the same professor gives me a call and says, Sun Microsystems is looking for an uh, ambassador, Sun Campus ambassador, who is ready to evangelize Java in different Sun technologies, such as NetBeans, Solaris at the university, and to build the community, blah, 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 blah. And he says, like, I'm looking for someone who is ready to do that. And I go, like, yeah, I'm ready to do that. And I'm the guy who probably barely still knows Java, but I saw this as an opportunity, let's say, to learn something new by teaching others. And I'm just, yeah, I'm jumping on the call with Sun and go, yep, yep, I'm ready. I know Java really well. Well, in fact, I didn't know it really well. And eventually they offered me a job. And uh, 
for the for the next two years before the graduation, I was building a sun community at my university. We were building, we, we created a lot of different nice projects. We built a strong community, not in at the university, but also in the city. And eventually, Sun offered me uh, a full time position after the university after the graduation. But once I got this offer, I accepted this offer. But then Oracle acquired the company, and all the hirings were frozen. So then I just you know joined another company. But eventually, a year later, I passed several interviews and I joined the Java development team, not at Sun but at Oracle, and I spent many years there. That's awesome. Uh, a lot of people think of me as a C-sharp person, and they don't remember or realize that I was actually uh, at Nike in 1997, in the middle of 1997, and I was using Hot Java, which was a Java-based browser from, from Sun at the time, and we were writing cross-platform uh, Windows, Linux, Mac, Hot Java, workstation devices for, uh, you know, for, uh, for Nike. So I, I, I have a uh, a place in my heart for Java that goes back many, many, many years now, 25 plus years. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, uh, I did not create anything for hot Java. When I started writing in Java, it was already Java 1.4 or something like that. Oh, wow. Yeah, people at those ta- days, they were saying that, hey, you are lucky because right now Java is stable. It, it's much <laughs> more powerful. But I do remember those talks about Java applets, about Java version 1.1, 1, 1, et cetera. Oh, yeah. Right when Java RMI, a remote <laughs> method invocation, it's a object-oriented uh, way of doing remote procedure calls. It was basically DCOM or distributed COM for Java. And we were trying to figure, basically REST APIs before REST, <laughs> people trying before to figure out. Is- Trying to figure out how to take a Java object here and put one over there on another computer and call remotely and pretend that the network does not add latency. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think we've now learned in the in the year of our Lord 2022 that the network does in fact add latency. Oh, so, and a lot. <laughs> so that brings us to our topic of the day: the network adds latency with Dennis, uh, which is actually uh, thinking about geo distributed apps. We were just trying to get these applications to talk to each other across the room or within the same building, not even just thinking about, you know, cloud availability zones. Uh, it sounds like you've been thinking a lot about applications that distribute themselves across the earth. Yeah, that's actually what I'm nerding on right now, if to put it, let's say, frankly. So right now, as you said, I am with Yugabyte. And Yugabyte is the company that creates a distributed SQL database, the database that is built on PostgreSQL. And there is a database is used by applications, right? It's, it's, it's obvious. But what, what I saw when I joined the company is that users and customers of Yugabyte DB, they in fact build applications that span across multiple availability zones or across multiple regions. And that's what excited me a lot because, and I wanted to dive deeper because as a guy who is on the developer relations team, my primary job responsibility is just to explain how to use Yuga by DB in the best way. But I always wanted to, let's say, to step kind of, not back, but even step higher. I wanted to look at Yuga by DB as the end user, as an application developer. As a Java application developer, Node.js or C-sharp application developer, who does a real business application? And those uh, applications that span those multiple zones or regions, I define them using this short and concise definition as geo-distributed apps. And what I think it's not just, it's just valuable to have this conversation, Scott, with you today to discuss, you know, some of the primary design principles that everyone should follow when building those types of applications. Uh, what does it mean for the application layer? Like, what do we do with your application instances or microservices? How those requirements are applied to the database tier, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that's a great point. And a, and a good way to, to maybe um, ground the conversation is to remind folks that may or may not be working in the cloud, whether it be Azure or AWS, that when you think about a region, it's not just like a Costco or a warehouse with a bunch of computers in it, right? A region like West US or East US or North Europe 
is a whole series of data centers, right? And within that, there's regions which have availability zones, which have N number of data centers, where N is usually a bigger number than you would think it is. Absolutely. And that's, I think, uh, thanks for thanks for reminding everyone what the region is, because yet yeah, most of us, I think that most of us are already in the cloud. We do build applications for the cloud. But some of us don't need to have the practical experience yet. But still, we, we keep hearing about, let's say, regions and zones, etc. And region, and, and what's like region is represents an independent geographic locations, like Scott said, right? And also, usually inside of every region, you have at least three availability zones. And those availability zones can be dedicated data centers, like sleep actual buildings that keep your server racks and keep your data and serve your user requests. And what happened actually throughout the last probably two or three years, and especially it's accelerated with the, with the beginning of the pandemic, many more companies moved to the cloud. And I think that many more of us witnessed that cloud, even though it comes with abundant resources like CPUs, machines, etc. Cloud environment is still uh, kind of prone to different outages. I just, you know, decided to check statistics. And uh, Amazon Web Services does a great job by publishing all of the major incidents that happened in the cloud. And according to those statistics, starting 2011, Amazon alone had a major cloud outage at least once a year. And when we are talking about a major cloud outage, that outage can make an entire region unavailable. Let's say that you build an application and that application is deployed in US East Zone, somewhere in North Virginia. And then for some reason, probably due to hardware failure or due to some human-made mistake, that region became unavailable. And if the region goes down, so does your application, unless your application is deployed across multiple uh, regions. So if to talk about, let's say, uh, geo-distributed application design principles, right? Before we talk about the design principles, let us uh, let me define the characteristics. And the characteristics might sound uh, like uh, buzzwords. Usually, if you Google for geo-distributed application, it's highly likely that you come across a resource from Microsoft. Microsoft Azure team defines a geo-distributed app as an application that spans multiple geographies for high availability, reliability, performance, and compliance needs, like something in those words. And here, as you can, Scott, say that there are too many buzzwords, right? Like high availability, reliability, performance, blah, blah, blah. Everyone says that. But how does it apply to our geo-distributed applications? When it comes to the high availability, it means that your application Let's say that you are building a messenger, something like Slack, like messenger. Your application needs to withstand all of those cloud outages. So if US East region goes down, then your application needs to be running because its instance runs in US West. When it comes to the performance characteristics of this app, you want to serve user requests from their location that is closest to your end user. Let's take this example. Let's say that your primary application instance and your primary database instance is deployed in uh, US uh, East 1 in South Carolina. And then you have lucky users who lived in the US East Coast. For those users, the latency time uh, for their requests from their location to your application should be around, let's say, 5 or 10 milliseconds, just on average. But if you have users from Berlin or from Paris, for them, the latency time can be around 90 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds. The things get worse if you move to, uh, east. If you have people from, let's say, India or from Singapore, for them, the latency can be 200 milliseconds or 300 milliseconds, just because your uh, instance of the application and database are running in the United States. And from the performance standpoint, your application should not behave like this. Your geo-distributed application should run with the same latency regardless of the user location. And there are several techniques how you can do that. Uh, for instance, the first basic one 
And that's obvious one. You deploy your application instances, your backend, right? Your front end in all of those locations. But then those instances have to serve data from somewhere. And that's a little bit more detailed and tricky conversation. So that's probably something that we will address. No, but let's let's uh, let's level set for a second to just remind ourselves a couple of things. So the fastest that data can move is the speed of light, right? So we're about 186,000 miles per second. And if you were going to take some light and spin it around the earth, like light doesn't fly, but let's just say you had a single fiber optic in a circle and you were going to shoot it, the quickest you can get all the way around the earth with no problem at all, no switches, no, it's 130 milliseconds. So it's going to take over a 10th of a second for me to talk to you. And then if you want to get a message back, there's another 10th of a second or 130 milliseconds. So already we're over a fifth of a second, which is very perceivable, Mm -hmm. right? So the problem that you're solving here by not simply hosting everything in Chicago is that the folks in North Europe or the folks in North Africa are going to have a lousy experience because it's going to be 50 to 100 milliseconds, not to mention network switches and all the little milliseconds that are added back and forth. So all these things can give a person a feeling of, wow, this site is slow. And then all the back the back end stuff that you're talking about. If you were had your data in Chicago but your database was in Singapore, well mm-hmm. now you're in big trouble, right? Yeah, absolutely. And also you're saying that yeah, it takes time, right, for your request to travel from one location to another. And all and always let's say all of those wires that, tra- that that send your request, it's not let's say the shortest line between the, your original location and final location. Usually, That's let's say point. if you are located somewhere in Mumbai in India, then mm-hmm. first your request can be redirected. I know, like I'm just imagining in Saudi Arabia. Then from Saudi Arabia, it can go to a data center in London, and mm-hmm. only from in, from London it can go uh, under the sea, under the Atlantic, sorry, under, under the Atlantic Ocean mm-hmm. to one of the data centers in the United States. So it's always kind of getting longer and longer and longer until it gets to your final destination. Hey, friends, let's take a moment and thank our sponsors. Basecamp is a project management and team communication application that's been around for around 18 years. It's used by thousands of companies today. It was built with meaning and intentionality, and every feature was designed with purpose with the thought being to help users simplify their workflow, try to keep things simple, and it's harder than it looks. But the team at 37Signals tries to make these hard decisions so our customers enjoy a tool that's simple and effective, and you use it to collaborate with internal teams and clients. It was built to help teams stay in the loop of the work they need to do without overwhelming everyone with countless emails and notifications. You can go to basecamp.com slash Hansel Minutes and sign up today to start a free 30-day trial. There's no credit card required, and you can cancel online at any time. If you want to know if Basecamp is right for your team, signing up for a trial is the best way to do so. Remember to go to Basecamp.com slash Hansel Minutes to get your free trial. Thanks, Basecamp, for sponsoring this episode. So is the solution to just figure out where they are and move everything as near them as possible? Or... Uh, where does a distributed database or systems like that fit in? Like, are you just keeping read-only copies as close as you can to as many people as you can? And isn't that wasteful? That's right. So there are several techniques uh, that we see companies and users apply in practice. But let's kind of break this down into several steps. Because when we're talking about an application, let's take the dump simple application. When you have just the application layer, you don't have any APIs layer. You don't have, let's say, any message bus. It's nothing like that. You just have your backend and you have front end. Typical web application. Then below that application layer, you have your database, your data layer. And finally, if you're de- developing a geo-distributed app, it's highly likely that you're going to use a cloud load balancer something, some special component that will intercept all of the user requests and forward those requests to the nearest locations of your application. So speaking about the application layer, the simplest one, that's what we usually learn to do like for for many, for many years. You created this web application and if that's a stateless application, you just, you can deploy an instance of this app in New York or in Chicago. You can deploy it in Berlin. You can deploy it in Mumbai. That's it. After that, you don't want your backend logic 
to know all of those locations. You don't want, let's say, you, you created a, your mobile application. You created the interface, front-end and mobile application. You don't want to hard-code IP addresses or DNS names of those instances. You don't do this. Just waste of your time. Instead, you can deploy a global cloud load balancer. That's a special component. It comes with any cast IP address. That's some, you know, one IP address that is known to your front end and your mobile applications. Your users send all of their requests to this IP address, and then load balancer can forward their requests to one of your application instances. For instance, let's say that Scott is nearby Chicago right now. He opens uh, the, the mobile phone and goes to your website, clicks, let's say, search the website, and the global load balancer sees that Scott is in Chicago, and we have an instance of the application in Chicago. So his request will go there. But if I'm in Mumbai, I decided to travel to India, and I open my application there, then my request will go to India. So that's the easiest part. The hardest part is the database, because the application instance it's, it's not a static page, right? Especially our web application. That's 21st century. We usually serve data and we do this dynamically. And when it comes to the database, I would say that there are several deployment options. First one is, Scott, you said the most well-known one is when you have, let's say, your primary database instance running in the United States and you can have read replicas in other distance locations. Let's say that if, uh, if I want to serve, improve read performance, then all I need to do is to attach a read replica to my location in Europe and then to the location in India. And that's good, right? At least the reads will be much faster. But this doesn't solve the problem with writes. As a side note, for some of the projects, for some of the applications, that will not be a big deal because in many occasions, you just need to accelerate reads and you don't want to boost any writes. But for those who need to boost the performance for writes, you have two other options. Uh, the first one is also quite well-known uh, deployment mode is when you have, when you deploy standalone database instances across the globe. For instance, one in the United States, the second in Europe, and the last one in Asia. And those standalone instances, they live on their own. They belong and they serve all the user traffic from those locations. If you need to synchronize those database instances, then you do this asynchronously. And there are good and there are always trade-offs. What's good is that those are separate instances. They run independently. They serve and they keep all the data for the users from that location. But if you need to, let's say, join data, if you need to request data from Asia, from Europe, merge it from with data from you know, the United States, then it's going to be painful for you. Okay, so let's do a callback here. All the way at the beginning when you and I were chatting about Java and I said I was working at Nike, I was doing an order management database. So we had products and orders, kind of like the very typical database, right? And uh, products didn't change that often. Maybe every day or two, there'd be a new product. But if the products were mostly up to date within a day or two, that was fine. Uh, orders happened very often, but the real concern was inventory. So we had a database where the product side was mostly reads, and it didn't need to be that up to date. But the inventory was being written to from all over. So what do you do when you have someone in Europe writing to the Europe database, someone in the US writing to the US database, et cetera, et cetera, and someone says, I need real-time access? Do you declare one database as the authoritative source and everyone just writes to it and you pay in the latency is what it is, and now you don't have to deal with syncing? Or is there a way to have minimal latency and always up-to-date uh, consistent data? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a wonderful question, because this last example uh, of standalone databases in different locations, it's a trivial one, right? And it certainly accelerates reads and writes. It will solve this problem. But from the real-time view standpoint, right, from the business analytics, etc., it's going to be painful. Mm -hmm. But if you decide to deploy a single database cluster, just let's say as is, 
then the latency will kill you, literally. Mm. Because let's say if we are talking about this project, like when you are you have inventory, you have products, right? Probably let's say you're some retail shop, then the consistency prevails, right? You cannot just let it. You cannot run and uh, run an update transaction and uh, just then believe that it will commit successfully or not. Yeah, you fire and sure. forget. Just yeah. write yeah. and forget. Yep, yeah, it's just not the reality of th- those types of applications. But in Yuga by DB, what we do, we have a special type of database deployment that is designed for these uh, applications. It's called geopartitioned. You still deploy a single cluster across the globe. Let's, for the sake of simplicity, suppose that you have one node in the United States, one node in uh, London and the other one in uh, Mumbai. And that's a single cluster. All of the nodes are aware of each other. They send heartbeats to each other. They exchange some system data, etc. But from their application standpoint, you need to define a special geo partitioning column, such as like a country code. Let's say you created your inventory, inventory table mm-hmm. or like order table. In the, in the table, you define country code column. If the country code column is, is equal to European Union, then all of those records will automatically go to Europe. If, let's say, the value of this column is Hong Kong or Singapore, then the database will store or serve this data from Asia. Is that a, this is a dumb question, but I'll preface it. Is that a real column with real values or are they just kind of meta metadata or meta columns that are giving the advice to the, to the database? It's like your, you know, that in the tables we have primary keys, right? And those primary keys are for what, for the uniqueness right. and for the integrity ID, of our data. Yeah. Yep. But this geo partitioning column is, uh, defines your, defines location of this record. So physically, like really in your table, you will have this column. This column can be actually of, it will be of the text type, like your stream, and you define your country code. It, it can be like country code. It can be country name. It can be city name. It just depends like what's what's your definition of the locality. It can be, let's say, the data center name or warehouse location, etc. It depends on the business. What's interesting, like how this feature works in practice, uh, those of you who are familiar with Postgres, MySQL, or Oracle, those databases has feature called partition pruning. Oh, sorry, called, called, called table partitioning. With table partitioning, you can split a big table into smaller ones. And you do this, you know, by defining some criteria. One of these criteria can be, all right, I have this column. This column is called country code. And if, let's say, the code is equal to the United States, then you need to put all of those records into this table, into this partition, into a smaller one. And that's the first feature. The second feature is table spaces. And the table spaces let you to assign different database objects, such as tables, to specific uh, hardware or like file systems. That's what Postgres does. What Yugabyte D does, Yugabyte also supports table partitioning. But when it comes to the table spaces, your table space in Yugabyte DB can be assigned to one of the clustered nodes that is located in one of the uh, locations in the world. And this is how the combination of two features, table partitioning plus t- uh, table spaces, uh, allow you to deploy geo-partitioned clusters of Yugabyte. So it was my understanding that traditionally or typically uh, when you say partitioning, you're grouping data uh, within a single database instance while sharding implies that the data is kind of spread across multiple computers. Where do you see, where is this kind of table partitioning versus sharding? What is the difference between those two things? It's uh, actually, you know, before before joining before joining Yugabyte, for me, table partitioning and, and sharding was synonym. I actually didn't see it, at least... I, I, I worked on another, on a different database, Apache Ignite. That's a database for high performance in memory computing. But when you join the world of relational databases, when you start working with Postgres, MySQL, or Yugabyte DB, there is a difference. 
So we do have sharding in uh, Yuga by DB. And it means exactly what you said. When you have, let's say, your table with some data, and sharding distributes all this data across your shards, your nodes. I, 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 I name shards as nodes, just cluster nodes. Right, right. What partitioning does, it's the operation that you do before the sharding. Let's say you have this ah. orders, you have the orders table, and you say that I want to split the orders table into three other tables, orders slash US, orders uh, Europe, and orders Asia. And I use special synth- SQL syntax for that. And then what the sharding does, the sharding will take the data from orders US, from orders Europe, and from orders Asia, and distribute the, the data across your cluster. But from the application standpoint, what's good? The application can certainly access orders US or Europe directly because those are database, like those are tables, but the application doesn't need to do that. The application code can always access just the orders table, and which is extremely you know, straightforward and simple. But then the database engine internally will figure out, all right, this application right now, right now wants to put an order uh, for this product. We have it's in place. We have it in the on the inventory list, and the product is being purchased in Europe because that's the country code I see in the insert statement. And then because the code is Europe, we will put this record into this orders Europe partition. And this has happened automatically. And as long as this partition is located on these nodes in Europe, we will forward this record to that node somewhere in the European Union. So this is what the database does. So as an application developer, it's all simpler for you. You just keep writing your code, pretending that you're creating a single zone application, just you know the same web application. But internally, the database does the magic for you. However, even though you're writing your code in your application in a way similar how you would create a single node application, like sin- single zone application, before that you need to architect everything properly. Because if you are planning to deploy a geo-distributed database cluster, you need, need to make sure that your schema uses all of those country codes and that your application instances are deployed close enough to your database instances. So as an example. Interesting. So how often do you think that the developer has to think about this though? Like you're describing work that the database administrator, that the architect, the cloud architect is thinking about. But if I'm just the person putting text boxes over data, this can be written and developed in such a way that I wouldn't have to think about it. I wouldn't have to be smart. Or do you think that the person on the front end or the business person, the business uh, developer has to be aware of these changes of these partitions and these shards? It makes sense. It makes sense to be aware of this. But when it comes to the, this this final example that we discussed for the last 10 minutes, that's an extreme one. I, mm-hmm. It's still kind of getting its traction. It's being used by one of the biggest companies in the world who, are, who operate globally, and they have to use this type of deployment. But if you, let's say, a mid-sized company or you're a startup or you're just building your application for the first time, when you think about geo-distributed applications, first think about high availability. So when you deploy your application, make sure that you can withstand at least, you know, a zone level outage. That would be my first advice. So design your application in such a way that if a zone within North Virginia region goes down, you are running, you are not down. So that's the first step. Then, for instance, if you are getting traction, you're becoming your your product, your technology becomes success and you see that you're getting users from Europe or from Asia, then just scale your architecture, let's say to Europe, just Make sure that your database right now has nodes in Europe, right? And you right now can deploy an application instant there. Just move incrementally. Mm. And eventually, when you grow to the point when you need a geo-partitioned cluster, only then you can start looking into table partitioning and table spaces and into the geo-partitioning mode of Yuga by DB. But there is always, let's say, this kind of growing curve. Usually you start small and the small yeah. means start with multiple availability zones. That's, I think everyone needs to do that. 
That right there, I think, is an excellent takeaway. If you're anticipating at some point going into another region, if you thought about availability zones and had at least two when you just started, it's going to save you a huge amount of re-architecture work. And I can I can attest to that. I had a small startup, and uh, we had a, we had a, our node in Chicago, and we had one in Portland, and we just focused on the U.S. market. And then out of nowhere, we blew up in Germany and Japan. And it took me, I think, an hour to bring up servers in Germany and Japan because we had already thought about geolocation distribution. We already ran all of our calls through a traffic manager that had uh, an understanding of location at its heart. And if you do the same with something like Yugabyte DB and you're thinking about two availability zones, you're going to save yourself a huge headache, don't you think? Right, absolutely. And that's actually what's, at least uh, that's that's the very, the very <coughs> right beginning of your geo-distributed app journey. So do this, do this, because as, as you, Scott, said, at least you don't need to be, you don't need to be, let's say, global from the day one, but your architecture should be able to scale to that point once, once necessary. You don't want to spend weeks and months trying to break and rebuild. That's, that's certainly what you don't want to do. And it's not a lot of work. I mean, we've discussed it in a 30 minute podcast. This is not something that we're, and I know that sometimes people say, Yagni, you're not going to need it, but you probably will need geo distribution at some point within your product's life cycle. So a little bit of work up front is worth the effort, don't you think? Absolutely. Absolutely. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Dennis Magda, for chatting with us today. Thanks, Scott. Happy to be here. You can check out Yugabyte at yugabyte.com, Y-U-G-A-B-Y-T-E.com. Again, in the past, they have been a sponsor of Hansel Minutes, but this is not a sponsored show. This is just Dennis and I chatting all about weathering the cloud storm with geo-distributed apps. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week.